So our uh, United Methodist rule book is called the United Methodist Book of Discipline. And uh, did you know that in this book there is a full paragraph that addresses eligibility for membership in a United Methodist church? Did you know that? So uh, let me read most of this paragraph for you. Got to get there. The United Methodist Church is part of the Holy Universal Church, as we confess in the Apostles' Creed. All people may attend its worship services, participate in its programs, receive the sacraments, and become members in any local church in the connection. Did you catch who's not eligible? I hope not, because it says all. It says all people may attend worship, participate in our programs, receive the sacraments, and become members of the local church. So that sort of begs the question, If we are that inclusive, if anyone can attend worship, if anyone can participate in the programs of the church, if anyone can receive the sacraments and become a member of the church, well, what's the point of joining the church? Well, there is one thing that changes when you become a church member in the Methodist Church. As a member, you are entitled, are you ready? You are entitled to serve on a church committee. (laughs) A real privilege, right? Uh, The Reverend Michael Slaughter, who uh, was the former pastor of the Ginghamsburg United Methodist Church in Ohio, would tell people who were uh, participating in membership classes, he'd say, you may not want to join because the moment you join, you are no longer a guest. You are staff. (laughs) And, And the difference, he says, is that a guest is focused on what they get from the church. Well, a staff member is focused on what they give to support the mission and ministry of the church, while at the same time making a commitment to grow in faithful discipleship. And so Ginghamsburg had uh, additional discipleship standards. And interestingly, uh, Ginghamsburg had about 90 worshiping members when uh, Reverend Slaughter was appointed there in 1979 with a promise from his bishop that if he did a good job, he would be moved to a bigger church. Well, Slaughter never left. And when he retired a few years ago, the worshiping congregation averaged between four and 5,000. And I suspect one of the reasons that Ginghamsburg grew from 90 to 5,000 in worship is the same reason that the Methodist movement took off in the 1700s. It was uh, because they realized that a life of faithful discipleship requires a supportive community. It's not just showing up for worship. And that our Christian walk is better when we do it together. As John Wesley uh, designed the Methodist societies, members were to meet together to, quote, watch over one another in love. That was John Wesley's phrase, watch over one another in love. And so in addition to worship and taking the sacraments and things like that, Methodists met in small groups to watch over one another in love. And this is why I often bring up 12-step groups as an example, because that's what they do. 
Now, this is the final week, as you heard in our Rooted Sermon series, where we have been focusing on our United Methodist heritage and values. Over the first two weeks, we took a look at uh, the, the history and development of early Methodism. And then over the last three weeks, we have focused on the three general rule that governs small group gatherings of Methodist. One, do no harm. Number two, do good. Number three, stay in love with God. It was the practice of watching over each other in love as we lived out these three rules that Wesley uh, believed gave life to the Methodist movement. Wesley did not believe that individuals on their own could succeed in fruitful Christian discipleship wasn't a do-it-yourself thing. And, and Wesley used it, a term, he, it was social holiness, to make the point that Christians could grow in community only with other Christians. And so uh, Wesley's statement was this. He said, the gospel of Christ knows no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. And, and sometimes Methodists make a mistake in thinking that he means social justice uh, or creating social, uh, ju- socially just structures in our society. But that's not what he meant. We certainly do seek that. But what he meant was you got to be together to do this Christian thing. So Wesley's emphasis on social holiness or the communal priority of Christianity, it's a theme that that is certainly a priority in the New Testament. And so I want to unpack this uh, looking at the scriptural roots for Wesley's assertion that there's no holiness but social holiness. Because I think Christianity today has become so accustomed to uh, using a a personalized language of faith. We have our personal beliefs, our personal saving relationship with Christ, our personal spiritual journey. You'll recall last Sunday I mentioned how uh, when the Hebrews got out of Egypt and they encamped around Mount Sinai, uh, they entered, God and the Hebrew people entered into a marriage covenant, that that's what was going on in in the commandments, that they were taking vows. And so the first vow is, you shall have no other gods before me. And, And it has that same weight and intention as that marriage vow that we make uh, uh, to cherish, love and cherish the person that we wed. And so what God is doing at that moment and what the Hebrew people do is commit themselves to fidelity to one another. But there's something else that happens in this story that's really unique. Uh, uh, In Exodus 19... Uh, verses 17 through 19, it says that Moses brought the people out of the camp to, quote, meet God. And it then describes how Mount Sinai was was, uh, wrapped in smoke and that when Moses would speak to God, God would respond in, uh, God would answer in thunder. Now, that's quite dramatic, isn't it? But what's extraordinary is that Exodus 19 indicates that it was the whole people, the entire community of people, not just Moses, who have this encounter with God. Now, the theological word for this is theophany. Theophany just means uh, the appearance of a deity 
uh, to a human. So when Gabriel uh, meets Mary and says she'll have a child, that's a theophany. And as you might guess, uh, many religions attribute their origins to a theophany. But, but scholars of religious, uh, religions point out that Exodus 19 is, is the first reported time anywhere where a theophany is not just to one person, but to a whole group of people. So it's not just like, you know, when Abraham was called. It's not uh, the story of Muhammad, you know, as a single thing. Even the story of Joseph Smith, you know, as a single appearance uh, to one person. Not so. And uh, as, it, as the Old Testament moves on, and certainly not in the New Testament. The, the New Testament reports this social dimension of Christianity from, from the outset as Jesus gathers a community of disciples who come to understand that he is Emmanuel, which means God with us. Not God with me, God with us. And I'd invite you to consider the stories throughout the gospel uh, where Jesus' divinity is revealed in group settings. And to point out the obvious, the Gospels all testify that the post-resurrection of Jesus to his disciples, it's not just one favored disciple, it's groups that are gathered. Even on the road to Emmaus, it's two people. A friend had said something to me that I really had not previously noticed, but he said that... Anytime God is said to be moving in Scripture, God is moving people closer to God and closer to each other. So this is one of the ways we can see, you know, false uh, sort of movements because if, if uh, there are Christian groups and other groups that are telling you, no, you're, uh, you know, we have to divide ourselves out, up so we can be closer to God and not them. Well, that's not the biblical story. God is always moving people closer to God. Finally, in Romans 12 and in other letters too, the Apostle Paul makes this communal nature of our faith and discipleship explicit. Uh, How much more uh, clear could it be than verses 4 and 5 in our reading? For as one body have many members, and not all members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. So I could draw on many more scriptural uh, uh, sources to demonstrate that this Uh, Wesleyan view that there is no holiness but social holiness is entirely consistent with Scripture. Uh, Wesley knew that when Christians go it alone, uh, we are treading on dangerous ground. We will begin to preference those parts of our faith that resonate with us, that we find comfortable and comforting And we will ignore anything that challenges our personal beliefs, preferences, and opinion. I don't think Jesus made a lot of people comfortable. (laughs) Methodist scholar Kevin Watson writes this. He says, when Christians overemphasize personal piety, they tend to focus on the individual's relationship with Jesus Christ, but do not pay sufficient attention to the role that we are called to play within the body of Christ. On the other hand, those within the church who have focused on the importance of works of mercy and social justice have often overemphasized mercy, well, 
underemphasizing the importance of a growing relationship with God in Christ. And, and then he, he writes this, and I think these are very important words uh, uh, that he speaks into the midst of our fractious political and cultural milieu. He writes, unfortunately, the tension between personal piety and social action has become increasingly political. Many Christians bristle at the mention of social justice, seeing it as a liberal agenda, divorced from genuine faith in Jesus Christ, while other Christians have become very cynical about any talk of personal piety as just being a thinly veiled excuse to avoid caring about the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized. Doesn't that ring true? So how do we find a balance as we strive to love God, which is personal piety, and strive to love our neighbors, which is uh, our, uh, mercy, this, this is exactly what Wesley was trying to create with Methodism. To create a blueprint for discipleship that balanced works of piety and works of mercy. And if we can truly watch over one another in love, we can help each other as we strive for balance both in our personal and collective discipleship. You know, I think a church that's aiming in that direction is, is one I'd like to join as a member. Because as the adage goes, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if we want to go far, we have to go together. So let's go forward together, amen?